Good evening, everyone. My name is Kirsty, and I'm one of the librarians at Wyndham City Libraries. I'd like to begin tonight by acknowledging the Bunurong and Wadawurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the lands on which Wyndham is being built. On behalf of our guests, I'd also like to acknowledge the Ghana, Ramindri and Namindri peoples as the traditional custodians of the lands they are joining us from. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Tonight, we are joined by author Dari Fraser. Her popular Australian historical fiction books include the Murray series, The Good Women of Renmark and The Last True Heart. Her newest novel, The Prodigal Sister, is an enthralling historical mystery filled with intrigue, romance and the new field of criminal forensics. I'm excited to hear what she has to say, and I'm sure you are as well. Welcome, Barry. Hello, Kirsty, and thank you, Tim, for your intro. Hello, welcome, everybody. I can see uh, so many people have joined us um, on our guest list here, so thank you very much for coming along tonight. I guess I'll, I'll start off uh, with a little bit about me and I would welcome your questions as we go through. Uh, don't say them all until the end. Um, I need to know that I'm not gonna bore you to death while I'm, while I'm having a chat. Um, the first thing I guess is that a lot of people ask me, when did I start writing? Well, well, when did I start breathing? I mean, you know, as a five-year-old, I, I learned to actually physically handwrite, but probably a little bit before that, I was always uh, telling stories or a storyteller, as my mum and dad would say. And um, I've never, I've never lost the magic of of creating a story and telling a story. So it started very, very early for me. And during my early years. Uh, in a primary school um, in Victoria. I was born and bred in Melbourne. So my primary years at school in Victoria, uh, I, I used to love the opportunity to read quietly if the, um, if the lesson required that or write a story if the lesson required that and uh, often I would just I would just start with a thought or, or a couple of words and away I'd go. But my my earliest memory of wanting to put together a story that meant something to me was when uh, the family, my family went to live uh, at Swan Hill and that was in the uh, mid to late 60s and uh, the gem, the big paddle steamer uh, gem had just been put in situ there uh, in readiness for the pioneer settlement at Swan Hill. So once that was up and running, I had a portal or, or I didn't even know it was a portal, but I, I believed that I was walking across the deck of the gem into the pioneer settlement and I believed that I was time traveling and going back in time. So I still time travel. I time travel every day and um, my beloved decade of the 19th century, as some of you might be aware, is the 1890s. I do dip a little bit back further, but I don't like to go anywhere near um, or beyond or earlier than about the 1850s. So um, my writing history has been an interesting one in that uh, when I first started what became my first published novel with HarperCollins, and that was Daughter of the Murray, published in 2016, I actually started writing it in uh, 1982 and I'll just hold up a book here for you. I, I can't see anybody there so I hope you can see what I'm about to show you. I thought at the ripe old age of something something mumble mumble in my 20s something something that um, uh, my life was getting on and I needed to do the thing that I wanted to do and what I wanted to do was desperately write a novel that would be published. So I bought this book, I bought a pencil and a rubber and while I was living in Alice Springs, I decided I would pen the greatest novel known to man. And of course it is, and I've still got it. And here it is, <laughs> all in pencil in this notebook. Um, God forbid the house burns down. So uh, that novel was ready to be uh, transcribed to a typewriter. And back in the day, we still had to use carbon copies. And I thought I'm gonna have to hire a typist because I didn't know how to type. 
So uh, I just got that manuscript finished and I was ready to send it off to publishers, as I said before, the greatest manuscript ever written. And Alice Springs uh, had the opportunity, finally, of having TV. And we were very excited to see a new series come to the television. Uh, and I couldn't wait to see it. Sigrid Thornton was in it. John Waters was in it. Oh, my Lord, it was on my beloved River Murray. And when I finally saw the series, All the Rivers Run, my heart dropped. My life left me. I had to shelve my most wonderful novel that the world had ever seen into the bottom drawer uh, for a long time because All the Rivers Run was pretty much... <laughs> exactly what I'd written in this most marvellous novel. So that book had to go into the bottom drawer for quite a number of years. It did come out from time to time to be revisited and re-loved and uh, um, added to and amended and edited and so on and so forth. And then with the advent of computers, I was able to uh, put it onto um, uh, the word processor and and see whether or not I could still make a go of this. So from 1982 to about 2012, I had this idea that the world was going to be ready again for an Australian historical fiction novel. And uh, again, long story short, with my, my writing career up to that time, uh, I rejoined a writer's association and decided that I would pitch my novel to uh, Harlequin Mirror, which has now been taken up by Harper Collins. And I was lucky enough in 2015 to be offered a contract for that book, this one right here, which has now become Daughter of the Murray, the first book published in 2016, which of course I am wildly excited about and still wildly excited about. So, um, that, that was my start, if you like. Uh, I did have a, a number of successes with short stories and The Woman's Day was very kind enough to publish my first short story called Clara Wells' Patience. You might be able to see it there, might be back to front. But Clara Wells' Patience was something that I, I wrote on a whim, sent it off once again and was lucky enough to, to have it uh, accepted. So I was reasonably sure that what I wanted to do uh, I could achieve. However, uh, from from that mark in 2015, 2016, I had no clue how it was all going to go. Anyway, um, Kirsty has kindly offered to host me tonight for uh, The Prodigal Sister. And The Prodigal Sister is book number seven with uh, Harlequin Mira. That's the imprint under which uh, Harlequin, uh, sorry, Harper Collins publishes the book. And as some of you might know, if you've if you've read my stories, um, I'm I'm very much interested in women of the late 19th century who were not ahead of their time, as a lot of people think these these women in my stories might be. They're not ahead of their time at all. I believe that women were as vocal and as opinionated and as capable and as 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 career minded as we are today uh, except the laws of the land and sometimes the 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 familial restraints uh, were against them when i think about the people or the characters i conjure up uh, I, I can't separate them from who I believe we are today. So my personality would have been mirrored um, in the 19th century, the same as yours would, Kirsty's would, Tim's would, behind the scenes there, Tim. Um, w w human nature doesn't change so much. It's just the laws under which we live our lives might be more restricted or, or, or well, more restricted. So uh, we don't tend to, to shine a light. And because in that era, of the 19th century, a woman was still deemed to be property rather than person. Uh, if she was property, she didn't have legal right. So once, uh, especially Australian women, began to gain legal right, uh, and South Australian women were amongst the first to vote, uh, and they were able to vote at the election in 1896, then uh, I think we'll be, we're seeing an emergence of women as a power. And once the crusty old white fellas got an idea that 
the vote might have been um, uh, boys, uh, bolstered by women once they got past that women don't know what they're talking about thing um then the 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 spotlight sort of turned a little bit did take a century or more uh, for them to understand that the female vote is quite an important vote so most of my stories are are based around um the emergence of women as a voice especially after federation which was quite an important turning point for the nation or as the nation came to be. So I've done a little bit of talking now about my, my journey. I can see we have a number of people on our list here. So if anybody's got any questions for me, please bob up and, and let me know. I can see we've got, um, we've got Anne and Brenda and Debbie and Helen and Jazz and Jinda and Kerry, Karen, Sarah, Vicky and another Vicky. So hopefully you've got some questions for me that you, you'd be able to drop into the messages there. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll just keep chatting. So uh, Kirsty, if you would like to drop in with anything at any time, please, please go ahead. I would much rather I know what people are interested in hearing uh, from me than my just blathering on, as I tend to tend to say. So once Daughter of the Murray was published, and uh, in publishing speak, your first book is only offered on a one book contract because they, they want to check that you're not going to fall over or you're not going to disappear or you're not going to write something rubbish the next time. So once Daughter of the Murray did its thing and thankfully it did its thing really well, uh, my publisher came and said to me, we'd love to offer book, Terry. So what it now. <laughs> I, I think I'd spent 30 years writing this first novel and uh, I actually didn't have anything else in the mix. However, get, getting into the groove of uh, being able to deliver and being able to, to, to embrace the thing that I had most wanted to do in my life, I thought, well, I'm, I'm, I might run with a bit of a theme here and my theme was to remain the Murray River uh, setting for a start uh, for a couple of books after that. So where the Murray River runs uh, came uh, in the following year from Daughter of the Murray. And whilst it's not a sequel, it is called uh, a companion book in Publisher Speak. Some of you might have read those particular two. Uh, that book is really quite close to my heart in that um, I was able to uh, track the, the families that I'd introduced in Daughter of the Murray and take a little spin off those uh, familial relations and build a whole new group of characters there. Again, on, on the Murray River uh, in Victoria, which of course has a, a, a really quite a special place in my heart. And visiting the port of Discovery at Ichuka was, was a highlight of those early years um, when I was um, researching all of this this sort of thing. Uh, fascinating history there. So where the Murray River runs was accepted by the publisher, thankfully. So they wanted another book in the Murray series. Pardon me. And I thought, well, I've got a story churning, but I wasn't really quite happy with it. Excuse me a moment. So I thought, well, how can how can a brand new author not be happy with a story that they that they you know? And and I've got to fulfil a contract, so what can I do here? Anyway, uh, as I as I tend to do, I trawl through um, a lot of pictorial uh, books and magazines, and I'm a great one for taking inspiration from something visual. So I was looking at a number of works by Fred McCubbin and Tom Roberts, um, Tom Roberts, uh, uh, visual artists uh, of the of the day. And I came across a, a, a Tom Roberts um, bail up, which was a rather a large uh, oil painting of a stagecoach. Uh, being bailed up by bush rangers, and I thought, oh, a few stories in that painting. Anyway, I've gone off to sleep. Might have been two or three days later, but that sleep, uh, I woke up with this dream 
that I, it was so vivid for me that I, I got up, turned the computer on, belted down this chapter, which I thought would be fantastic as an opening chapter for book number three. Uh, now that chapter turns out to be chapter two in book three, which is now The Widow of Ballarat. So I took a little step aside from the 1890s and from the Murray River, and I just had to put down uh, this story, The Widow of Ballarat, and that is set against the backdrop of the Eureka Stockade. And the research for that book was absolutely fascinating. So uh, I, I'm still quite taken by that research and by the, everything to do with Ballarat around that particular era and how important it was in shaping um, who or what our nations become, certainly towards Federation um, 50 years later. Uh, and so the third book in the series, in the Murray series, The Good Woman of Renmark became the fourth book, if you're still with me there. But The Widow of Ballarat definitely pushed her way in. And uh, thankfully for me, it was accepted as my third book. So fourth book is The Good Woman of Renmark. And we go back to the River Murray, but in South Australia. Uh, the fifth book was, what was the fifth book? Good Woman of Renmark, it was. Um, Elsa Goody Bushranger. Elsa Goody Bushranger is set in South Australia and and goes into Victoria. So from Robe in South Australia into Casterton in Victoria, which follows the uh, the route that the Chinese people took when they were here uh, coming for the gold during the 1850s. But it is set in 1898. And uh, that story came about um, I wanted more in South Australia, which is where I live. I live on Kangaroo Island in South Australia, but I wanted more uh, of my stories to be set here. And because the first vote for women in Australia was in South Australia, we got the vote passed in about 1894, 1895, but the first vote at the polls was on the 25th of April, 1896, auspicious day for, for two events that occurred uh, 20 odd years apart. So I wanted to know who was the first woman who voted in robe in 1896, because I was pretty sure it was going to be Elsa Goody. And as it turned out, uh, after all my research, nobody has the electoral rolls in that e uh, area for that particular first vote for women. So I was able to allow Elsa to be the first woman and I found a snippet in Trove, which is the um, facility of the National Library of Australia that digitises old newspapers, that the first woman to vote in robe voted at 9.45 in the morning, but they didn't record her name and the electoral roll can't be found. So I was able to slip Elsa Goody in there and that was a very important part of the story for me that she was determined to have her vote. And so uh, because that lady wasn't named historically, I was able to just shift Elsa in there. So Elsa tries to save her family farm, chasing some money that she knows was in the family. And she goes into uh, Victoria to Casserton, uh, tracking that down. So I had a lot of fun with that, a lot of history uh, and fact. All, all my stories have a lot of fact uh, backdropping um, the the um, the main story, the main theme. Um, and so from Elsa Goody Bushranger, there was The Last True Heart, which is set in Victoria. And those of you who come from uh, Melbourne uh, and Williamstown or the Williamstown area might be aware that there was a an American Civil War steamship warship that docked in Williamstown in 1865 and I was so enthralled by that snippet of history that I just had to write a story about it. So The Last True Heart begins uh, a chapter or two in 1865 and then jumps to 1898. So you can see by my just talking about the books that have come out since 2016 that 
Victoria and South Australia, the river, my great loves. And uh, I continue to find a number of stories in those two colonies. Oh, that's me time traveling again in those two states. <laughs> I talk about colonies because that's where my head really is. So the new book, number seven, The Prodigal Sister, starts in Melbourne, again at the turn of the century or well, right on 1900, when women were being uh, awarded their Bachelor of Arts, not that they hadn't been prior to uh, 1900, 1896, 1898, but they weren't equal to the Bachelor of Arts that a man might study for. So around about 1896 or 1898 in, in uh, the United Kingdom, especially, uh, women were afforded the same level of Bachelor of Arts as a man. Uh, and that opened a lot of doors for women if they had money, of course, or if their fathers pushed them um, or, or agreed to, to um, fund them uh, to study further. Uh, the emergence of forensic science in the colonies, in the Australian colonies, took a little while to take off, but it was available on the continent in Europe, especially in France. And so I, I wanted a heroine who had studied in Scotland in particular, my heroine Prudence, uh, and she was coming home because the family had a medical issue. Uh, and so she was needed at home, which meant in that day that her aspirations uh, had to go to one side. Prudence also carries a uh, the risk of an inherited illness which has no cure, still has no cure, and by name that's Huntington's disease. Uh, and in the day she and her father, who's a doctor, were very aware that Huntington's comes down through the family line. So she was determined that whilst her sister and her mother suffered from this disease, she may, she may suffer eventually from this disease, but she would not marry and have children, uh, whereby um, risking her children to have this incurable disease as well. So automatically I had a woman who was going to put her eye on her career. She would not marry. She could not have any personal relationships with a man. Uh, she couldn't risk pregnancy because she felt she, she couldn't risk passing this inherited gene along her family line. However, uh, she is blackmailed, shall we say, into working for the police to spy on somebody else. And then sparks fly and all the plans just fly out the window. But Melbourne uh, right on the uh, on 1900 was a very interesting place, and I hope I've conveyed that without being uh, too historically um, deep. And uh, of course, Federation and the the celebration of Federation was only around the corner in 1901. So my main thrust is about women moving through their lives with the heavy restrictions they had but without being superheroes, without being super women, they were just ordinary people doing their thing like you and I might might do today um, with as many personalities as we have around us today, they had, they had in their time. So um, I might see if any of you have got questions for me now before I keep going. I've been speaking for 30 minutes already, I think. So um, I'll take a sip of my tea and uh, Maybe Kirsty, you've got something you can help us out with here. Sure. Um, I think everyone's been listening rather intently, um, but um, I was wondering if you'd be able to speak about your research because um, reading the Prodigal Sister, Sister, like it really came alive to me with the history. Uh, so. Um, Around about 1900, if, we talk, if we're talking forensi forensics, for instance, in France at that time, there was a fellow who, I, who, who I, I've named in the book, Monsieur Le Cassagne, who uh, they, some, some um, academics call him the father of forensic science. Uh, he 
he started his his uh, work with the police, shall we say, in the late nineteenth century, where whereby if he came if 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 if, if People came across a terrible crime. Um, it was oh oh look, he's been donged on the head with a heavy instrument. Oh well, gee, wonder where the murderer is. So Monsieur Lacassagne and his team were able to say, well, okay, hang on, he was donged on the head with an instrument. Where would that be? Was that a rock? Was was that a hammer? What what did that look like? Can we match um, the the instrument to the wound? Or perhaps the the deceased person might have had a hank of hair in his in his hands, and uh, could could we match that to somebody who might have been known to uh, consort with that person, or so on and so forth? Um, the interesting thing about finger, um, uh, what do you call it? Technology, f fingerprint technology. Sorry, just lost my words here. Uh, was that they were very aware that the fingerprints were were quite unique, but how how we can lift those prints off the crime scene was something that they needed to work on. So uh, while we we do know that they had certain technology, it wasn't perfected enough to be able to present to court or whatever not without a, a really good uh, team behind you. So there was a lot of work going on in France at the time, but it hadn't actually skipped the uh, the, the strait into the United Kingdom. And of course, the United Kingdom um, was our um, colonial bosses, if you like. So uh, it took often six to 12 months for any technology to reach uh, the Antipodes at all. So our police forces were a little bit clumpy and a little bit ordinary on, on on taking up new practices and so on and so forth. Uh, so Monsieur Lacassagne was one. Um, the the most famous, I think, of the forensic science, scientists early didn't actually emerge until around about 1920, which is uh, Mr. Lacard, and he is the he is the principal scientist who said every perpetrator, every every victim leaves something of himself at the scene or there is an exchange of evidence at the scenes. So the basis of all forensic science is, is on that particular theory. So uh, whilst forensic science was around early in the day, of course, uh, 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 in that early part of the, or late part of the 18th, uh, 19th century into early 20th century, it wasn't a study open to women at all. We were, we were just being allowed to uh, enter medical sciences and have our, our bachelor degree in, in medical sciences around that time. But a lot of the doors were shut to ordinary women with intelligence unless they had a lot of money and their fathers were behind them and uh, they weren't expected to marry and so on and so forth. Um, I touched a little bit on uh, researching Huntington's disease earlier and in America, in the 1870s, there was grandpa, dad, and son, Huntington's. So Drs. Huntington from three generations had documented a particular family on Long Island who had these strange symptoms. And once the youngest of the doctors, um, Huntington, had had collated this uh, information from his father and his grandfather. He was able to see patterns by which Huntington's came down through the generations. And so he is um, the person uh, who um, gave his name to the uh, syndrome or the illness. And it's, it's one of the most fascinating illnesses and, and, and I, I apologise to anybody who might have family members or might be suffering from Huntington's themselves. But having done a lot of research in the day, they understood it to a certain degree. But then it took another 100 years into the 1970s if anybody further to see the, what might be the key to Huntington's. So I did quite a bit of a study on Huntington's. To, I'm a, I'm a total layperson when it comes to anything medical or anything scientific. Uh, 
uh, in the 70s in America, uh, they were able to uh, identify the mutated gene that is carried from one person to their to their children and so on and so forth. What they did know in 1890, which is, uh, or late 1890s, which is when the prodigal sister is set, is that it was passed from mum um, and dad to the children and that there was a risk of at least 50% that those children of people carrying the mutated gene would get Huntington's disease. So the whole premise of my story was that Prudence didn't know whether or not she would be in the 50% that did carry the gene or the 50% that didn't. Uh, so Huntington's, by, by, by way of being a, 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 dreadful, a dreadful thing to have to inherit, was also uh, an illness that um, suited the purpose of my story, shall we put it like that. Uh, and then, of course, um, Police practice in the day in, in the colonies was a little bit dodgy. Um, I did use a real person in the in the um, character by the name of Mr. Chomley. He was a real police commissioner in Victoria of the day. And uh, uh, so I was able to weave quite a lot of fact through through the story. Uh, but ultimately, ultimately, it was uh, that Prudence was was trying to find her feet. She'd already gained her Bachelor of Arts at St Andrews in Scotland before she came home to help look after family, which was expected of most women in the day. Um, but how she was able to to navigate her way through the things that were thrown at her, uh, and 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 had a little bit of luck on her side. So uh, hopefully that's covered a little bit there, Kirsty. Yes, thank you very much. Um, Tim has asked, um, what in particular is it that draws you to the late 19th century as opposed to other eras? Uh, good question, Kim. Um, I find that the 1890s um, is probably, uh, if I can put it like this, during the gold fields uh, around about 1853, 1854, and those few years after Eureka Stockade, we do know by, by research that women of that time in Australia, in Victoria, had the opportunity to vote as early as 1860. So without, without being too long-winded about that particular serendipitous moment in time, uh, from the goldfields time, women, uh, especially in Victoria, which is where I, I sort of more focus, uh, and South Australia, because they were the first ones to to be allowed to vote in the 1896 elections. Um, the, the the movement towards um, the franchise, the voting franchise for women had already started around about that mid 1850s mark. So, and I'm not an historian either, I'm just an observer. So looking at different points in history over that next 40 years from 1854 to 1894, um, 50 years, um, uh, there is a movement towards the women becoming, <coughs> pardon me, more autonomous. And so by the 1890s, there's, a, there's quite a groundswell and there's a lot of societies and associations where women can join um, looking for their right to vote. Now, a lot of people say, oh, were they all suffragettes? No, they weren't but they might have been suffragists, which is the universal push towards the voting the, or de democratic voting. So men didn't always have the vote either, the working man, but the, the moment he took out a minor's right in 1854, he had the right to vote. So there was a bit of a hiccup, a clerical hiccup in the writing of the laws around about 18... 56, 57, which didn't dictate that it was a man the miners' right 
could be awarded to. It was a person. So some very smart switched on woman said, oh, well, I'm a person. I've, I've got a minus right. I can vote then. Well, we can probably still hear the boots scurrying backwards as they went back to their um, uh, legal papers and crossed out person and put male back in there. So if there was a, a, w a window of space where women could have <laughs> made a push. Yes, made a push to to vote. And I think a lot of the times when I'm observing, uh, and again, I'll just reiterate, I'm not an historian and I'm certainly not a forensic historian. Uh, I, I observed that women had the opportunity, first of all, didn't know about it. Secondly, didn't want to do anything about it. Thirdly, didn't know how to go about doing anything about it. And fourthly, weren't probably allowed to. So for a long time, the rumbles of uh, the female vote was sort of uh, toing and froing in that sort of 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. And then suddenly a lot of women were starting to be very vocal. So, Kim, by the time I got to the 1890s, I'm hearing all this rumble historically where women are just starting to say, hey, we can, we can do this. We've got a brain. One of the major arguments against the female vote right before Federation was that, well, what on earth are we men going to do if the women have a brain and go out and vote? But who's going to look after the children? Duh. Who still looks after the children? So uh, at the turn of the century uh, and in the, in the um, uh, conferences to do with the Constitution, in 1901 that we finally got in 1901. The, South, the vote for South Australian women in 1896 was intrinsic in having it written into the con constitution that anybody, despite race, gender, religion, had the right to vote. So it was the, the vote for uh, the South Australian women and it gets quite convoluted that was able to push that through to the federal constitution. Um, now, I do have to say that when I was at school, I used to love history, but Australian history was so mind bogglingly boring, my eyes still cross. Um, but since being able to, to write my stories and to have the absolute luxury of research, I'm, I find it absolutely fascinating and the argy-bargy that went on um, the 10 years prior to to our constitution finally being set basically uh, not in concrete because it can be changed but set down has been absolutely fascinating so i saw glenda popped up there did she have a question um no i think that was um her connection dropped Just out popping in. She's pop okay. popped back in so welcome back right. Uh, though Anne has has a question um, there, um, how you you obviously do a lot of research. Um, how how much fiction, like how how much is fact and how much is fiction in each book? Okay, so um, we've talked a little bit about um, in the Prodigal Sister. There is the research for Huntington's um, and uh, Commissioner Chomley and so on. What I, tr what I try to do is bring fact into my character's day because I'm, I'm setting my characters into a particular period of time that is quite real. And so I want to know what their political uh, what, what the political atmosphere was like, what their social atmosphere was like, what restrictions might have been, what laws were around then. So I try to research that as much as possible. Um, in one of the stories, and I've got to think maybe it was, uh, uh, maybe it was where the Murray River runs. Um, I had to learn what the trains looked like in the day. Uh, you know, did we have carriages that opened each cabin opened up to the platform or did we have a a corridor that went through the 
the the carriage or did we just have seats in the car? And that was uh, particularly hard to actually locate. The other thing was, um, just, as a, just as a point, um, I had one of my characters stop at a little railway station in Victoria called Rochester. And he needed something to eat. So I only presumed that the ladies of the town would would bake up different bits and pieces and, and try to sell things to travellers because they would need uh, income. And uh, of course, every little bit helped. And, you know, there's terrible drought in, in the 1890s and into uh, into at least 1903. So people were looking to supplement their income. Anyhow, I had uh, my main, my character, um, I do forget which one, <laughs> and he'd stepped off the train, he was starving. So there's a, a pie vendor, a woman, and she says, oh, here's a pie, here's, here's a couple of boiled eggs, um, here's a paper bag. Now, this is a character saying, here's a paper bag. I mean, I know I write that, but the character said, and I thought, oh my, when did we get paper bags here? Oh, it took me a week to find that paper bags had been in Australia uh, since about 1860. But I didn't want to put paper bag in there if we didn't have paper bags in there until after, the, you know. So, uh, and the only way I found that we had, that I could that I could tell you with concrete evidence that we had paper bags from 1860 was in a newspaper advert. And so, you know, we you might tend to think that some of the things uh, authors will put in their stories um, are just run of the mill things we don't tend to think about. But but that paper bag issue sat with me, and that might be as boring as anything to anybody else. But I had to know for sure that we had paper bags there, and there's lots of those little bits and pieces in there, even even things we might. Uh, use in everyday language, we might think oh, must must have been around then, but there's a very uh, loose sort of period of time over around 20 years or so when things are first seen to pop up in written articles or reports or whatever that might have been in the vernacular for 20 years, but uh, we can't actually pinpoint. So I tend to only pick things I know are based in, in fact. So w when you ask me how much is fact, as much as I can possibly determine in my books. My characters, my main characters are all fictional, but I do dot in real characters around um, those main characters, yes. So the answer is as much fact as I'm able to determine. How are we doing? So Anyone asleep yet? <laughs> no, I think everyone's still still listening. Good um, Tim has another question. Um, sure. He'd like to know what was one of the most surprising, disturbing or amazing things you found out while researching for your books? I, I, I truly, I, I truly think the most amazing thing was that reference I mentioned about the the miners' right uh, around 1856 into 1860, where some clerk had made a whoopsie on the miners' right and not inserted the word male. He'd put the word person. So when you worked on the gold fields, it, you had to have a miner's license, whether you were digging or not. The only people that didn't have to have a miner's license were women, so wives and children. But if you were a laundress or if you were a shopkeeper, uh, and a lot of women were shopkeepers, a lot of women were publicans, and that was another interesting thing that's that's in my story for 2024. And I need to say that 2022 is done and 2023 is done, release dates. Um, I think the, the the biggest surprise I got was that because women weren't ready to take up this idea of franchise collectively, a huge opportunity slipped them by. 
uh, and it and it took it took a lot of poking and provoking to organise women to, to to actually make a united front and demand the vote. And throughout that particular period of time, there is still the pushback from women who didn't want to vote, who didn't want to usurp the family uh, arrangement, who didn't want to go against their dads or their husbands or their brothers or whoever it was. And whilst I'm not talking about total anarchy or, or, or insurrection, um, the, the voices of the thinking women uh, were actually few and far between. So whilst we accept that, wow, we didn't have a voice, we weren't allowed to have a voice, we didn't use our voice either. And that was very surprising to me, very. Fantastic. I'm going to have to go away and do, do some research now. <laughs> you made me very interested in, in history. Um, because as you said, a lot of the, the history that was being taught in schools was very different. Um, oh, my pending, pouring. Oh. Mm. <laughs> um, Anna said she always likes your covers and wonders if they're all designed by the same team or person. Aha, Anna. Good question. No is the short answer, they're not, but the HarperCollins uh, team, uh, design team, are given a particular brief of the story. Uh, and uh, from what I understand, once the story is accepted, it, 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 it moves in, you know, everything goes in, in, into a line because there's lots of books being published at the same time. And so the design team is given a brief of the story and you might notice that um, a lot of covers have certain themes for certain authors. So at the moment, mine seem to be, uh, of course, the, the woman in period costume. Um, and, and I might say on that particular point there, my characters are not 21st women in period costume. They are women of their day. In the, in the costume they would have worn in their day. So the design team are worded up on era. Uh, and um, most of my more recent covers, and I mean from about the widow of Ballarat, have been to do with uh, the, 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 the image of a, a woman, generally from the back or in profile, sometimes uh, front on. Um, and she's, uh, she doesn't engage with the reader. She's very much her own person, but the backdrop is generally with uh, a water, uh, water environment or river. So, so that gives uh, the reader uh, my brand, if you like. So, um, I'm rural. I'm I'm river. Uh, uh, I'm 1890s, and so from the first concept, the design team presents three designs of cover to the big boss, not to me, <laughs> to the big boss. And he says yay or nay. And then it comes back to me uh, with the final cover. So this is the only cover or only concept I have seen for the prodigal sister. Now, their prudence, and, and she's pretty much prudence, this particular image, uh, very straight back. Uh, she has clearly got uh, a good a good dress on, so she th there's money in the family. She is looking off to um, well off to the left, so um, I don't know which way that's going, but she's looking forward as far as I can tell. Now the backdrop is uh, the gardens around the Yarra. Uh, in, in Melbourne. So they've they've again brought in the the river as being the life force or uh, around um, my heroine. So I am presented with that cover and my first and only response must be, mm, I, I love it. So once we have I love it, 
then we're, we're good to go. Um, uh, the story itself takes a lot longer to get through the process than the cover, but uh, the cover artists are, are pretty thorough and it's the sales and marketing team that actually sign off on the cover. So I hope that's answered your question there. Fantastic. Um, I'll, I'll just remind everyone um, because we're, we're getting close to the end. If you've got any questions, pop them in the chat um, and I'll, I'll read them out. Um, and Anne's wondering which states um, are the, the 22 and 23 books. OK, <laughs> so I got really excited about the next book that's coming out this year. However, it was scheduled for next year, but I got so excited about it that I asked to, to swap the two books. So the book that's coming out this year, it now has a title. Once again, I um, uh, the author has little to do with the titles, but I've been lucky with this one. This one is called The Forthright Woman, and it is set in South Australia, uh, all set in South Australia. Now, any, any of you who might know anything about South Australia, there is a fabulous region called the Flinders Ranges, southern and northern Flinders, and it was a very, very lucrative uh, agricultural area in the mid to late, no, I'll say the mid 18th, 19th century, so around the 1870s. Now, if any of you are visiting here, first of all, get through your wineries and get through all the lovely stuff that we've got and go north, people. The countryside in the southern Flinders and the northern Flinders is absolutely spectacular. Now, there's one particular point between two small towns, one of which is named Corn, and the other is named Hawker. Now, in that area was a very lucrative um, sheep grazing um, a number of properties, and the railway was going to go through there to the mines, um, the copper mines in uh, the northern Flinders, which it did. Uh, now, some of you might have heard of the Goida line, which is a, a, um, a line that a surveyor drew for the people of that particular end of the century to say that you won't be able to grow crops or graze sheep or cattle past this line because, because there's only salt bush and drought. Um, and they, they poo-pooed him, but he was quite, quite correct. So for a few years, this area was com absolutely lucrative. And there's a marvelous set of ruins over about a kilometre and a half called Kaniaka Ruins. And it's one of the most magical places I've ever visited. And that just fired my in, um, uh, imagination. And so I've written the story drawing on some of my own uh, family history from way back, which is an arranged marriage between Italian people, um, the Italian people's immigration to South Australia and how uh, lucrative an area this was before terrible drought struck in uh, the 1880s. So uh, the forthright woman is set totally in South Australia in this most beautiful area of the state. Um, and the milliner of Bendigo, which is now coming out in 2023, uh, is partly set in Bendigo as the title would suggest. And I go back to the river uh, Adichuka uh, for that as well. And and that story um, showcases how incredibly tough society was um, f when we're talking about people being engaged or being promised to marry. So I, I look at the breach of contract of marriage uh, situation and any of you who have watched Bridgerton over the last couple of seasons are aware how how stringent the rules were, especially earlier in the century, um, around people um, making a contract to enter into marriage and so on and so forth. Still fairly strong in the later period uh, of the century, 
and still certainly ruined your chances of a good marriage thereafter if things went wrong. So the Milliner of Bendigo um, addresses those sorts of issues as well as things like the early professions or the early journalists in Australia who, who felt they needed to be independent. Uh, and that was quite a lot of fun back on the river. And just to top that off, story for 2024 is uh, dipping back between Victoria and the South Australian colonies. And I um, can't tell you too much, but I will say that women are taking back some of their power. So how's that? <laughs> well, I'm already looking forward to, <laughs> to those books. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned you don't have um, much say in the title because one of the questions I was going to ask um, was going to be why the prodigal sister? Because I have to confess, I have a couple of times accidentally called it the prodigal daughter. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether that was due to the um, relationship between Prudence and, and Valerie, but um, maybe you had no choice. <laughs> No, it's an it's an interesting thing, and and um, thanks, Kirsty. It's a it's a it, it's a question that comes up time and time again. Um, a lot of the time, because the title is uh, so important, marketing as is the cover. You know that old thing we have: we don't judge a book by its cover. We all do. So the cover has to suit the market that the book is targeting. Targeting, and the same with the title. So we have Daughter of the Murray. So there she is in her own entity and she loves the Murray River where she goes. Where the Murray River runs has sort of stepped a little outside of that, but an another book by another Australian female author was named River Run at the time that came out. So they had to tweak that a little. The Widow of Ballarat gives her her identity. She's a widow and she lives in Ballarat. The Good Woman of Renmark, much the same thing. Um, much earlier days, wives were called good women. The Good Woman of of Joe blogs or whatever. So again, she's she's got her identity within the time constraint or the period constraints. Elsa Goody Bushranger, she stepped out of her uh, out of the. Um, perimeter, if you like, and that's one title that I came up with. <laughs> but uh, she was supposed to be Elsa Goody Accidental Bushranger, but they dropped the accidental. Uh, so Elsa is her own person. The last True Heart, again, uh, Stella True Heart is actually the last of her bloodline. She had no brothers to carry her name through. And where am I up to now? The prodigal sister. So I, I wasn't sure about the prodigal sister, but I, I didn't actually have anything to offer. And I, the prodigal sister, you know, um, brought up with the prodigal son as the, the biblical story, you think, oh no, it doesn't, doesn't really sit. But uh, as it was pointed out, most people assume that prodigal means coming back to the family after some problem away. So in that, it um, it set well. And with Prudence's uh, relationship to Valerie, I think Valerie, uh, without giving anything away, Valerie showed herself to be quite a strong personality in her own right. So Prudence actually came back in a bit of a spin. And so I think prodigal not in the real term, but in the in the loose term that we've come to know, I think that suited her reasonably well. So I hope that's answered your question there. And for this year's book, The Forthright Woman, yay, that was my title. So I've had three out of seven. That's not bad. That's not bad. <laughs> yeah, I'd take those odds. Yeah. <laughs> um, now I, I asked for some final questions. Um, mm -hmm. just in the chat then, because we're, we're just about out of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Anne has asked, are you ever going to write a book set in Western Australia? Oh, of course I will, Anne. <laughs> I just have to get over there. Um, I would love to actually. I, I, uh, there's a number of really good Australian authors who, who come out of uh, WA, as you might be aware. Um, 
I'm not sure that there's too many uh, Australian historical fiction authors at, at my in my sort of genre. Um, but what I don't want to do is to be one of those authors who visits a place and says, oh yeah, I'll tick all those boxes and off I go. I really want to be able to immerse myself in a nugget of history that I can say, yep, I, I have that. So it does need travel, which I'm not adverse to, adverse to. And um, I would love to spread my wings, but my, my, uh, my, my own history is embedded in Victoria and now in South Australia. So if I go to the West or if I went to Queensland, I mean, I, I, I lived in Northern Territory for a long time as well. Um, uh, New South Wales, I, I tend to dodge around. I haven't lived there, so I haven't actually immersed myself, but that's not to say never. So yes, give me a nugget and I'll work on it. <laughs> You'll go down that research spiral. I will. Mm. Uh, so we've got one one more question. Sure. Um, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Uh, oh, this is a great question. It's one I always like to ask too. Thanks, Helen. So Helen has asked, um, which writers do you enjoy reading? Oh. Um, lots. I enjoy lots and they're, they're probably not ones you would assume I would enjoy. Um, I love, I don't love police procedurals so much as crime. So, um, but having said that, I, I love uh, Karen Slaughter, Lisa Gardner, these are American authors. Uh, there's an uh, emerging author now, Nina D. Campbell. I'm enjoying her debut novel, Daughters of Eve, immensely. Um, Sarah Barry is one of my Harlequin or, or HarperCollins stable mates. Uh, she writes great crime and her Unforgiven uh, was excellent. Um, but, you know, I, I enjoy, I enjoy the classic, Enjoy um, uh, where the crawdads sing. Um, that was that was a great book. I love that. And our own Karen Manton wrote the Curlew's uh, Cry, which was wonderful. Um, there's just so many. I don't I don't have a particular genre that I that I stick to. Um, I'm currently in the middle of uh, Gentlemen of Moscow by Amor Trow. Read there, but I'm enjoying the ride. Pardon? Sorry, you you were cut out briefly there, just after oh, right. a gentleman in Moscow. Yes, so Amor Tales, uh, Tale, he's the author. So I'm sort of cruising through that lovely, luscious read. Um, look, it, just lots of people. You know, I, I revisit things like Gone with the Wind. I know that's that's got a a funny thing at the moment I don't care um, the read is is wonderful the writing is wonderful um, it just, lots and lots but I I don't read prolifically anymore I can't um, the luxury of reading is is that half an hour before sleep now um, and I find if I read a, too much in my own genre which I don't tend to do anyway uh, I, I worry that my voice might might actually pick up another voice that I I don't want in my own work. So uh, I'll read anything. Story has to be good. Well, I'm sure people have jotted down a few of those titles. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much. And uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. It's been so fantastic and I've learned so much um and i'm sure everybody else has as well uh we've got um most of your books in the library collection including the prodigal sister uh which is in uh ebook e audio which i recommend the narrator is great that's how i read it uh and then we've got the print copy as well so you can pop Wonderful. a reserve on any of those uh, so thanks once again Dari. um and 
a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks, Tim, in the background there. Good night.